We greet all of you tonight in the name of the Lord. Those also who have joined us in in live stream. This is a a fellowship that we're enjoying in in the truth. An opportunity to opportunity to, to be of one accord. We're in the uh, Gospel of Luke. This will be our second exposition of this book. We're going to be looking at verses 5 through 23. <clears throat> there was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea, a certain priest named Zacharias of the course of Abia, and his wife was of the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord blameless. And they had no child, because that Elizabeth was barren, and they both were now well stricken in years. And it came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in the order of his course, according to the custom of the priest's office, his lot was to burn incense when he went into the temple of the Lord. And the whole multitude of the people were praying without at the time of incense. And there appeared unto him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zacharias saw him, he was troubled, and fear fell upon him. But the angel said unto him, Fear not, Zacharias, for thy prayer is heard, and thy wife Elizabeth shall bear thee a son, and thou shalt call his name John. And thou shalt have joy and gladness, and many shall rejoice at his birth. For he shall be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. And he shall be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And many of the children of Israel shall he turn to the Lord their God. And he shall go before him in the spirit and power of Elias, to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just, to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And Zechariah said unto the angel, Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man, and my wife well stricken in years. And the angel answered and said unto him, I am Gabriel, that stand in the presence of the Lord, and am sent to speak unto thee, and to show thee these glad tidings. And behold, thou shalt be dumb, and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words, which shall be fulfilled in their season. And the people waited for Zacharias, and marveled that he tarried so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak unto them, and they perceived that he had seen a vision in the temple, for he beckoned unto them, and remained speechless. And it came to pass that as soon as the days of his ministration were accomplished, he departed to his own house. Amen. <clears throat> now the uh, Gospel writers, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, These kind of start a little bit different. Mm -hmm. Matthew, he begins with the genealogy of Christ. Mm -hmm. Mark, he says, this is the beginning of the gospel of Christ, the beginning of the gospel of Christ, the Son of God. Mm -hmm. Luke commences with the announcement of John the Baptist's birth, and John commences with the Word becoming flesh and dwelling among us, and then he launches into John the Baptist. Now these uh, different versions, they confirm to us the absence of simplicity in God's great salvation. See, the salvation was so big, no, no single person could, like, right. give a digest of it all. So that's why there were these 
for and Luke was a Gentile, so he he come with a, even a little different perspective. Redemption is, as we've noted before, like a multifaceted jewel. Now it's not painted that way in our day. In our day, salvation is approached and talked about as though it was a very simplistic thing, and of course that approach has yielded a lot of unfavorable results. Now to have a uh, a proper appreciation of the of the gospel and give an appropriate response to it, there's some considerations that should be taken into mind. I'm giving this to show that men must be liberated from stultifying simplicity. Yeah, amen. Simplicity and uncomplicated views shut your mind down. Yeah. That's, that's what they do. For instance, it's necessary to know the Savior's role in creation. That's why John brought it up. The determination of how sin would be addressed had to be made prior to the creation. So you, have to, you have to realize the hopelessness of the natural human condition. It is a hopeless condition. No psychiatrist will say that. No sociologist will say that. But that is the condition. You've got to see that. You've got to see a need for salvation that's just and righteous. Yeah. See that very few people make mention of this. You've got to get the picture that in salvation, God kind of backed off and condescended. and It's kind of the picture that you get from what's being said. Salvation has to have been, has to be, has to result in true righteousness in the ones that are saved. Okay, that, that is not taken for granted in our society. Yeah. If someone is righteous, that's unusual. Mm -hmm. There must be a demonstration in order for there to be effective salvation. There must be a demonstration of man's natural inability to cope with Satan. Mm -hmm. That's got to be laid out and proved to man. So the only morally perfect man that ever lived couldn't even survive one encounter. And that's the time to teach you something. So, man, so fallen man sure isn't going to be able to. If in that beginning state man, man couldn't. There's got to be an appropriate introduction to the fact that men cannot be saved by law. It's not just that men need to be told what to do. That'll do it. If you just tell us what to do, then we can do it. You may have to see that, no, this isn't the truth. Yeah. And there's, there's no power in religious routine. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, in our day, there's been a revival of religious routine. Yeah. And it's sweeping the country. There's to be a confirmation that beholding and even participating in miraculous, the miraculous mm -hmm. has no power to change men. Yeah, amen. That has to, before we ever have salvation, yeah. these yeah. things have to be established. The proper preparation is for a Savior to come into the world, not for a Savior to rise up from the world. Sin has to be taken away before there can be, before there can be salvation, sin has to be taken away. And sin has to be depowered, for want of a better term. There has to be in salvation, sin has to lose its power. And there has to be an effective conferment of righteousness. Righteousness has to be conferred to people. And the means of sustaining men in a good fight of faith has to be has to originate from the power to from heaven. It has to it can't be originate here on earth. Amen. I'm saying these are things that had to be established before we ever started out on this Amen. salvation. There had to be a means of enabling chosen men to transmit the truth of the gospel. 
without flaw or mitigation. There had to be some means that we know what the means they were, the Holy Spirit revealed it to them and guided them. We, that's how, but that had to be done, see, before, before salvation could be preached. Yeah. It had to be guaranteed that the people saying it were right. Yeah, amen. Amen. And that they delivered a proper message. Mm -hmm. The means of ongoing and progressive change. Salvation, as we found out, is not instant in all of its depth. So there has to be a means for progressive change. There has to be a means of preparing men for the inevitability of death and the judgment. If we don't get people ready for that, that, that it's not salvation. Amen. And a savior has to be thorough and in in whom men will be made complete. There, there can't be anything else needed yeah. than what's in the Savior. Amen. See, now all that has to be established before we can embark, embark on mm -hmm. salvation. Now, it's been demonstrated, but it's also to be preached. Mm -hmm. These things are to be preached and declared. People have got to see this. Now, the Gospels require introduce to us the kind of Savior that was required to save us. They make known what the divine nature looks like when it's in the flesh. Amen. All right, that's what you see in Jesus. Yeah. What you see in Jesus now, this is what God's like yeah. lived out in a in a person, a flesh and blood Amen. person Amen. lived it out. Mm -hmm. So all proper comparisons have got to be made with Jesus. Amen. Men can't compare themselves among themselves yeah, uh -huh. with that person over there, and he's worse than I am, or I wish I was like him. It can't be. You've got to be make a comparison with Christ because that's the, he's the embodiment Amen. of the divine nature. The sinfulness of man is confirmed by his rejection of the Christ. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to talk anymore about his man. <laughs> Sin for is man depraved. We don't have to discuss this at all because yeah. men are the ones that slew Christ. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Yes, it was according to the will of God. I understand it, but men did it. Yeah, amen. Angels didn't do it. Mm -hmm. Men did it. Yeah, so that tells you the condition men were in. And not just men. These were the best men that did it. Yeah. These were the people that heard from God, the people that had a law from God, the people who had been chosen by God, the people who were loved by God. That's the people that did it. Amen. So that's the people at the best state. And the Savior will be presented to us taking the same course we all took, birth, growing up to adulthood, learning, becoming wise, Growing in favor with God and man. He went through all stages humanity went through, the rest of us went through, except he went through it without sinning. Amen. Now, during his ministry, the Lord Jesus, who was God, manifest in the flesh. This is a divine nature. This is how he talks, what he, how he lives. He expressed a disdain for hypocrisy. He expressed an intolerance of unbelief. He had a high regard for faith wherever he found it and an absolute refusal to comply with a lifeless form of religion. This was God manifest in the flesh. You want to be like Jesus, so you, at some point you got to... <laughs> you have to conform to that. I wanted to say a a word about the poverty of a merely outward religion. I say merely outward. There is an outward aspect to religion. In fact, religion is the outward. Right. Yeah. Amen. This gospel makes known the poverty of a, a religion that's only outward. The Pharisees will be shown to be corrupt within. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's why they were corrupt without. If our eyes aren't open, are open to the content of this gospel, if we can see what he's saying, in this case, the gospel according to Luke, we'll see why believers are to be devout, godly, self-sacrificing, 
and consistently conscious of God. This will establish without people that aren't this. We don't know if they're Christians. <laughs> we don't know if they're saved. We like to think they are, but we don't have any evidence. Because if you're not like Jesus, then how are you going to prove Jesus is in you? And if Jesus isn't in you, you're out. Amen. So this is the kind of people, kind of Savior we have. And the kind of people, we're going to find out in Luke, the kind of people God uses. Yes. He's seen it Zachariah, Zacharias and Elizabeth. They were righteous. He's seen it in Mary. Mm -hmm. it's holy. He's seen it in Joseph. He's a just man. Seen in Simeon. These are people God used. Now, these are people God used. Seen in Simeon. He was righteous. Seen in Anna. She was righteous. Seen in the 70 disciples that Jesus chose. They were godly, did what Jesus said. Seen in Joseph of Arimathea. He was a righteous man waiting for the kingdom of God. And the 12, with the exception of Judas, tell you what kind of people God uses. Yeah, amen. God does not use for his purposes of salvation unholy people. Yeah, that's right. amen. And there are a bunch of unholy people in the ministry. Yeah. That's right. And there are a lot of unholy people that are elders. Mm -hmm. And there are a lot of unholy people that are deacons mm -hmm. and church administrators. Uh -huh and song leaders, and youth leaders. Amen. God does not use that kind of person. Yes, amen. Amen. The seriousness of this is staggering because the Pharisees were very, very religious people. They really had given up a whole host of things yeah. to be what they were. But because they weren't like Christ, they counted for zero. They, right. they couldn't understand and see. But the, the, and that was bad enough. But see, now it's much worse because the Holy Spirit has been given. That's right. Sin has been taken away. So it, this is very serious, what you're talking about. You can, you, you can see the devil's strategy. Mm -hmm. It appears to have worked. But see, God's going to show you that it, yes. it's just a temporary situation. But the church, the way we just got, the way I just got through talking is not the way that the average churchman talks. Yeah. This is not what the average church people expect. Mm -hmm. In fact, anyone that's remotely like this, everyone knows, is very unusual. Mm -hmm. And it may even be counted as odd or kind of wacky. Yeah, that's right. yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, this is the truth. All right, having said this, let's get down to this um, Zacharias and Elizabeth. <coughs> Now, the, the time is pinpointed. There was in the days of Herod, the king of Judea. So that just pin, is pinpointed. Herod was an Idumean. He was a descendant of Esau. Hmm. Now, you remember Jacob in uh, prophesying over his son said, The scepter shall not depart from Judah nor the lawgiver from between his feet till Shiloh come. Yeah. At this time, the scepter had departed mm. from Judah. Yeah. Okay, Shiloh's going to come pick it up yeah, amen. to belong. But it departed. You got a, you got a descendant of Esau mm. ruling over Jerusalem mm. and over Judea yeah. in which Jerusalem resided. This is the same Herod who mandated the destruction of all the infants two years and under. So you have a pinpoints the time of this during the reign of this despot, <laughs> this descendant of Esau, this Edomite. There is a specific priest that our attention is drawn to. A priest named Zacharias of the sort of the course of Abia, which is the Abijah of, of the scripture, old scripture, 
he was a uh, he was in the significant lineage. Abijah was from the tribe of Levi, and uh, Zacharias was from that tribe, and his wife Elizabeth was from Aaron Aaron's tribe. Aaron he was from the tribe of uh, Levi also, and he was Moses' brother. So this you couldn't get you know more qualified people that way. Throughout Scripture, the more closely an individual or a group of individuals is involved in what God is doing, whether favorably or unfavorably, the more specific their identification. So the closer, they, if Moses draws close to God, you learn more about Moses than you did about some other people. If someone's especially hostile toward the people of God, like Nebuchadnezzar, they say you learn more. You, that, that's the major who's, who gets the commentary in Scripture. The closer they get involved with what God's doing, whether pro or con, then that we're more their, their identity becomes more specific. Specific enemies are named: Cain, Pharaoh, Abimelech, Herod. Inimical cities are named: Jericho, Sodom, Gomorrah, and so forth. Nations that are inimical are named: Egypt, Canaanites, Ammonites, Philistines. See, any time they get involved with God's people. For good or for bad, they're identified, and there's some specific things mm -hmm. said about them. All of this is because the scripture is really about the Lord. Amen. The scripture is not a textbook on good living. Uh -huh. yeah. You all, you find that information in there, I know, but that's not what. Mm -hmm. That's in the law. You want to know how to live to the law. Yeah. Yeah. Go to the law. That tell you how you're supposed to live. Won't give you any alternatives to living that way either. Mm -hmm. Now, note the moral status of these people. These people are God going to use. They were both righteous before God yeah. and walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord, blameless. Yeah. Well, that can't be. Nobody can walk that way. This is what the Holy Spirit said. Yeah. See, God delivers us from simplicity. Yeah. There's a lot of simplicity when you get to talking about blameless and walking in all the commandments and ordinances of the Lord. Some people, they, they, they found out all people are by nature sinners, so they say, well, that can't, how can that be? Well, I'm going to tell you how it can be. The Holy Spirit didn't make a mistake. Yeah. Make a mistake here. These two ordered their lives punctiliously. Yeah. Without Christ, without being justified, Without the gift of the Holy Spirit, outwardly, they were spotless. Yes, amen. That's what we're talking about here. We're talking about outward. You don't have to be a Christian to be outwardly pure. Yes, amen. The people say, I can't help it. Oh, you can't help it. You can clean up your outward life if you're a Buddhist. You can do it. If you're a Muslim, you can do it. Uh -huh. It's just that that's not enough. Mm -hmm. That's not enough. Now, several people in Scripture have been described as righteous. This is not strange language to us. Noah is said to be a just man and perfect in his generations, and Noah walked with God. So there, there's, there's a man, righteous. Job was described as a man that was perfect and upright and one that feared God and eschewed evil. So there, here he is. Instead of David, David did what was right in the eyes of the Lord and turned not aside from anything he commanded him all the days of his life, save only for the matter of Uriah the Hittite. This kind of obedience was found in Peter. We've been given a bad rap too often. Uh, he was. Un we understand him to have been one of the older disciples. When the Lord let a net down from heaven and it had unclean animals in it, he said, Rise, kill, and eat. Peter said, I have never, I have never eaten anything that's uncommon or unclean. I told you the kind of man Peter was. He wasn't a profligate, he wasn't an immoral man, not Peter. Paul also. Now, Peter's assessment was when he saw the Lord, he said, I am a sinful man. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. As compared to Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. 
Now, Paul, he lived this kind of life, too. Circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, and Hebrew of the Hebrews, is touching the law of Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is of the law in the law, blameless. Amen. There you are. Mm -hmm. So our, our theology has got to make room for this kind of yes, amen. <laughs> expression. This doesn't negate the saying, "There's none righteous, no, not one." This doesn't negate that. And see, the simplicity talks makes an issue out of this, yeah. doesn't understand. Mm. The meaning of none righteous is there's no one that has developed their own righteousness mm. yeah. so that they can stand before God. Yeah. Amen. Mm. They may have punctiliously fulfilled all the requirements of the law. Mm. It'd be hard to find a person's hand, but evidently we found a couple yeah. in, the, yeah. in uh, Zacharias and Elizabeth. Mm. But even if they had, minutely obeyed all the commandments of the law, they still have to say, like Jesus said, we're unprofitable servants. Yeah. We have only done that which it was our duty to do. Amen. So doing all that you're commanded to do is not enough. Yeah. Whatever God had required of Zacharias and Elizabeth in the law, they had done. One of their peers couldn't drag them into court and pin something on them. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They hadn't done. Now in our day, sin is so rampant in the professing church that they've not declared the necessity of doing what God has said. Yeah. They quit saying this because mm. they got this situation where outwardly mm. <laughs> uncleanness is prolif has proliferated throughout the church. Yeah. Outwardly can be seen by the world. The attitude is, everyone has sinned, so sinning can't be that serious. I mean, people don't actually say that, but that's the kind of the summation of their thoughts. What all of this has done is diminished a sense of the need for Christ. Yeah, amen. So you can, you can, you, if you don't, if you're not convinced of sinfulness, you just put Christ up on the shelf. You don't need Christ. We admit, we, we admit this. We'll admit this. Mm -hmm. That if you can prove you're without sin, you really don't need Christ. We can, we get to substantiate that this, this is the way it is. See, that is true that God has saved some people from the depths of sin. This is true. You won't find many of them in Scripture. I'm sad to report. But... It, it's true, that they're trophies of God's grace, but what are those trophies to be compared to Noah, Moses, John the Baptist, Paul, the 12 apostles? Which trophies are the most significant? They were trophies too. Yes. Which trophies do we preach? We don't have these other kind of trophies to preach. Unless it's someone that was demon-possessed and then and then dispossessed by the Lord Jesus. Now again, this doesn't mean you draw unwarranted assumptions. I'm just saying this is how God set the tone so that bad people being saved is possible. But it is also the exception. This is not the standard. The grades of salvation is not I that again. Do I what? Uh, the, now you're saying, what are you saying about, what are you saying just then now? now you, that God doesn't save the bad people? And, no. And I'm you, saying in the scripture. Uh huh. God, yes, God, there's no question God can save the worst among us. There's no question about that. But when it comes to the people God used, those aren't the, aren't the cases he cited. It doesn't mean he can't do that. It means that if he did cite cases, and there's no question about it, that there were cases, men would use those cases as a standard. So he, he reports conversions of godly people. The difference would be the Jews that murdered Jesus. That would be the... But they did, that was a religious... They thought they were doing God's will. So there's no question about, there's no question about 
that God can save the worst. There's no question about that. When it comes to being God employing people, he's very careful to report only those other kind of people. If he does use the others, we understand that that's just an extra, an extra mercy. Why? Why? I think I can explain why. Because when you've lived on the bottom, it's very difficult to get over that. Very difficult to get over that. You've got more, I've, I've tasted some of this myself, so that's why I, I feel like I'm an authority on this. The, the, your conscience will dredge up yeah. the past, and that can only be offset by an extraordinary measure of grace. Mm -hmm. That's the only way that can be overcome. Yeah. If you take a person that has lived the low life, and then they're converted to Christ, They've got to put it in third gear yes. and go high speed all the way. Amen. They've got, because they've got more. See, they're back. They were further, further back there, and Satan has this stuff to work with. Yes. Satan works with bad memories. Yes, but A couple thoughts, I think. One is, is that a lot of people don't draw any distinction when they talk about, and you address this, when, when we talk about there's none righteous, no, not one. When Paul, you've got to look at what Paul was talking about right. when he quoted that verse. That's a, that's an Old Testament quotation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and in Romans, Paul is arguing from like a macro level. Mm -hmm. He's he's like he's he's like up here that's looking right. at the race as a whole. That's right. Okay. Luke mm -hmm. is talking about two specific that's right. individuals. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. So so to read about Zachariah and Elizabeth about how they were blameless and say. Well, we know they weren't really blameless. See, that's missing the point mm -hmm. of the, what Luke is trying to say about Zechariah and Elizabeth. Yes. And the other, the other thought here is that we are talking here about an external that's law right. righteousness. That's mm -hmm. right. Now, Jesus addressed this mm -hmm. directly in what we call the Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. He talked about the law. And how it was, there was an external righteousness, but he said very clearly that is sufficient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Look at there, he says the law says don't don't hate mm -hmm. or don't don't murder, mm -hmm. but if you hate your brother, see yeah, that's coming from the heart. Sure, yeah. mm -hmm. So so that distinction between external mm -hmm. internal has clearly been drawn in Scripture. Amen. And it was drawn by Jesus Himself. Amen. We also Amen. have to be careful when we talk about stuff like this because people will get the idea, well, I've been a really bad sinner, so I can't do anything for the yeah. kingdom. That, 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 that will be a temptation to think. Mm -hmm. But see, the, the very fact that you're thinking like that probably is, is that the Lord, you, you do, have, you do yeah. want to do what's right. You, you have been redeemed. It, it just that, that, that can be a temptation. I know that can be. But um, uh, you, 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 you would have to look far and wide to find in the scriptures where it doesn't prove out what you're saying. It's just we don't have an apostle standing up saying this is the way it is. You see what I'm saying? Well, yes. I mean, that doesn't mean that it isn't inferred in Scripture, and I think that's what, what you're saying. I think what, this yes. is, if you look at the text, you look at what God did, and you've got to come to some kind of conclusion. Absolutely. So He's, hi he's highlighting outward, he's highlighting outward righteousness. Uh -huh. This is what he's talking about, outward righteousness. There are a lot of people that outwardly never profess faith, but they live exemplary outward yes. lives. <laughs> there are other people that their outward lives are terrible. Mm -hmm. Now, we, don't, we, we still preach salvation to people like that, but now those people like that that are converted have to be as extraordinary in Christ That's right as they were extraordinary out of Christ. Yeah, amen. Yeah. That's right. Uh, comment on Paul's two, two statements. It, these seem to me to be connected to what we're talking about here, where he said that according to the law, he was blameless. Mm -hmm. At the same time, he called himself the chief of sinners. Yeah, yeah because he, mm -hmm. he tells you why. Because he persecuted the church of God. Yeah, yeah. uh-huh. That's the word, that was the worst sin. Yeah. Uh-huh, yeah. 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 Mm. yeah. He wasn't chief of murderers, yeah. or thieves, or immoral people. Mm -hmm. 
He said, because I persecuted the church of God. That's why. God uses people more that know him more. So the more you yeah. know God, the more you will be apt yeah. to be used. And, and uh, someone who has had a desire for God on and on and on, maybe they, they were in a simple, we all were in a simple state before we were saved. And we, and we know all this stuff. But, mm -hmm. but um, according to how, I mean, if you were in, like in the dredges of society, you probably didn't have a desire for God at that time. And you weren't even seeking after him at all. Well, you couldn't have. Yeah. yeah. You so, couldn't I mean, have. Yeah. Um, that's all taken into consideration yeah. with that too. But then we have um, the uh, Mary Magdalene too. You know? Now she had demons though. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. it doesn't say she was immoral. Mm -hmm. Said she had seven demons. Yeah, but if she had demons. She still was immoral. You could right? just be she deaf and dumb. That's not. You could have been deaf and dumb. That's not. That's not immoral. I think you'll find the people that were demon possessed. It wasn't immorality. You, 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 <laughs> well, yeah, but you yeah, just I'll check it out. No, no one that was committing sin was told that they, they were demon possessed. Maybe they were, but that was that's not what it, what it was said. Yes. Yeah, we got to remember too. This is a this is a particular context. Yeah. 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 This is yeah. a Jewish context. Zachariah <laughs> and Elizabeth. They're not even run-of-the-mill Jews. I know. Yeah. They're, they're exceptional even yeah. for Jews. Yeah. And the yeah. Jews were exceptional for the rest of the human That's race. Right. Yeah. Do you think, at, at this point in history, do you think that God could have just gone anywhere on the planet mm -hmm. and found someone like yeah. Zachariah? Oh, no. 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 This was a product of several centuries of law. That's right. Mm -hmm. That produced... Zachariah and Elizabeth. This was not. They weren't Greeks. They weren't. They weren't Romans. They were Jews. Mm -hmm. And we're also talking here about the source of salvation. Mm -hmm. This is John the Baptist, the the forerunner to Jesus. Mary and Joseph were were exceptional too. You don't read about Mary and Joseph being immoral either. Yeah. So we're, God's bringing. See, this is the source of salvation we're talking about. Yeah. Is God going to bring His Son into a context that's, of wickedness? That's the point. This is the point. Yes, yes. this is the point. Mm -hmm. When we speak of, uh, see, it's it's no harder for God to save someone who's in the gutter as someone who's on a mountain. <laughs> it's not any more difficult for God. Yeah. It's difficult for the person yeah, that's right. who has to be apprised. Uh -huh. You got to recover a lot of ground. You got more temptation to face. You, Satan's got more doors to knock on. You, you got to be more alert, but it can be overcome. But this is not held forth because, as I understand, men would make it then a standard. Men would look and say, "Well, God, God can handle that." Well, technically, yes, but that isn't how it's approached in Scripture. <coughs> A blameless life is only technically possible in Christ. Right. In fact, it's a requirement in Christ. So when we speak of keeping the law, we're speaking of an outward, of outward, uh -huh. an outward life. And infractions of the law were outward infractions. Uh -huh. Paul hadn't committed any outward infractions. The commandment that tagged him was, thou shalt not covet, uh -huh. which is something inward. See? Saul of Tarsus did none of those things, as I said, yet he had a, he was provoked to come to God. Now I want to develop this a little bit more. Abel is said to have been righteous. God said to Noah, Thee have I seen righteous before me in this generation. Abraham asked the Lord if he would destroy the righteous with the wicked. David wrote of the congregation of the righteous. He saw them, showing that there were a righteous people under the administration of the law, but it was a certain kind of righteousness. The righteous are mentioned in Scripture 148 times. They're all righteous. A righteous man is mentioned 13 times. A read of the words of the righteous in Exodus and Deuteronomy. 
So these Zacharias and Elizabeth were righteous before God and blameless, and it's, I understand this to be referring to their outward uh -huh, yeah. lives. Amen. Now both of them, they were incapable of either begetting or conceiving. Men beget, women conceive. They were, uh -huh. yeah. neither one could do it. Elizabeth never could have children. Now both her and her husband are old, far beyond the age of children should be begotten. Now for those who rely on circumstance, this was an impossible situation. Yeah, that's right. No door of natural opportunity was there. Yeah, yeah. If God does not, if God really uh -huh. does work only with people who have the ability, then you're not going to be happy. Anything happen here? But throughout the ages, God has taught His people. Had God had taught His people yes. that with Him all things are possible. Throughout throughout the ages, He taught yes. them this. It was seen in the creation. Mm -hmm. It was seen in the flood. It was seen in the dispersion of Shinar. See, you can only account for these things by God. The birth of Isaac. Yeah. The destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah in the cities of the plain. He's teaching people. I do things that are impossible to be done by anybody else. The birth of Jacob and Esau. Israel's deliverance from Egypt. The exaltation of Joseph. The defeat of Jericho. The birth of Samson. The raising of the dead. He, he cultured his people with this all through history. He would there, here and now, every once in a while, he'd do something that could not otherwise be done. He's teaching his people with God, all things are possible. So when he announces yeah. he's going to do something that is impossible, yeah. the people should be able to yes. quickly scan their memory bank, yeah. so to speak, yeah. and see, but God can do things yeah. that are impossible. Amen. That's why these records are in Scripture. Uh -huh. yes. Amen. That's why if you, you take these records from the people, yeah. you can't expect them to think this way if they're not aware of how yeah. God has worked. That's right. The exposure of people to the record of God's great and mighty works moves them to think differently than the masses. See, at Pentecost, they, they knew Peter was talking about the wonderful works of God. They, they were familiar with those yeah. wonderful works of God. Now, as I uh, have suggested, there's an unfortunate absence of this kind of thinking in our time. This has caused a great deficiency in the people. They rarely ask for anything that's impossible. I've been in an awful lot of prayer meetings over the years. I couldn't, thousands, I don't know, maybe tens of thousands, I couldn't estimate how many prayer meetings I've been in. But until recent years, I never heard very much about asking God to do something that was impossible. Very rarely. Yeah. Now, sometimes we be with the doctor. Well, see, I pray that too. Mm -hmm. But you can come higher than that. Yes, amen. We can go higher up than that. Yes. Pray the diagnosis will be good. We can go higher than that. Yes. In fact, I, give, I, I kind of am inclined to think that unless a person can think higher than that, he's, a, he's had a tremendous handicap. Preaching, teaching, fellowship, discussion, all this center should leave people with the idea with God nothing is impossible. Yeah. Amen. People should kind of, yeah. uh -huh. and even then, mm -hmm. we're not guaranteed, you know. Only if our, we're in sync with God's will. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty hard to be in sync with God's will if you don't know what it is. Yeah. You know, the psalmist said this, and rarely have I heard this expressed. Well, I have heard it, but it's not common. Thy righteousness also, O God, is very high. Who has done great things, O God? Who is like unto thee? See, when you come to God with that attitude, yeah. you're more likely to be heard. Amen. Amen. Now, here's Zacharias and Elizabeth. They're both uh, the kind of people you expect God can use. They're, in the, they're among the a people that God can use. 
and he, lo and behold, now we find he's in the temple executing the priest's office. So that, that moves it up possibilities a little further. Yeah. Came to pass that while he executed the priest's office before God in order of his course. In other words, it came to pass. We've commented on these words frequently. But this language in Scripture is mostly a depiction of the progress of a divine initiative. Amen. Uh, maybe use others occasionally in other ways, but it generally it denotes progress in a divine initiative. It came to pass that as God works methodically, it's yeah. not human methodically, uh -huh. it's divine methodically, yeah. but it's, yeah. it's methodically because yeah. God is an orderly God. It teaches us there are things God accomplishes working them out mm -hmm. in specific seasons, by determined people mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with a focused objective. I was thinking while you were saying that about this, it came to pass. You know, the, the they these two people were not, Brother Jason sorry mentioned this, they were not even like like ordinary Jews were. Right. So it's this tells you that the Holy Spirit, God's been working in both of these individuals yeah. to come to bring them to a point to where this is if this is gonna happen now. This is gonna happen. But it wasn't by their design. They weren't like, they didn't know this was going to happen. Yeah. But they, but they were just serving God, and God was getting them ready for this this great work. Yeah. Amen. I, I don't doubt that they both were both aware of the prophecy of Isaiah about the forerunner, but it never had entered their mind because the prophecy didn't say it was gonna it was gonna be a miraculous birth. Mm -hmm. While he executed the priest's office. Now there was an event approaching that had to do with a determination made before the world began. Amen. Do I hear this event's drawing near, drawing near? Yeah. It's not going to take place in an environment that's not suited for the, mm -hmm. for the occasion. It'll take place in the framework of a divinely established yes. type. And how appropriate that it was with a man who was burning the incense. Yes, amen. Is that not appropriate? Yeah. Christ is a sweet fragrance to God, yeah. so here <laughs> this seems to be an ideal yeah. uh, type situation. While he executed the priest's office, he was serving his priest before God. Now it was according to the custom of the priest's office, so the, the Levitical tribe were the priests. There were thousands of them. Mm -hmm. It wasn't just a handful. And different Levites did different things. Zacharias was of the order that burned the incense mm -hmm. at a certain mm -hmm. time and for a certain duration. Mm -hmm. Aaron set these in the of old, Aaron was the one that burned the incense at the first. Aaron, Aaron shall burn there upon sweet incense every morning, see, and every evening. So originally, Aaron was the one that did it. But as time progressed, the Levites drew a number. Then there were certain ones. The scriptures don't say they were chosen by lot back in the old scriptures, but this one does. By lot, there was a lot cast. You, you do it during this time, you do it during that time. <coughs> Centuries later now, here we have this practice has been maintained. Yeah. This practice has been maintained for 2,000 years. Yeah. Been 2,000 years. 1,500... Uh, 1,500 years this practice had been maintained for 50, I mean, it's remarkable. Here he is, his time came, he came to the temple, and he performed his lot. Now, for whatever is worth, the Talmud, which is the Jewish book of tradition that they added to the law, which was the Torah, Talmud says the priest who obtained the right to perform this high duty was not permitted to draw the lot a second time in the same week, and as the whole number of priests at this time is very large, some say even as many as 20,000, 
Farrar conjectures that it would never happen to the same priest twice in his lifetime. So this may have been the only time yeah. <laughs> he performed this. The entire tabernacle and temple was organized. Paul might have had this in mind when he said, let all things be done decently and in order, see? So here he is executing the priest's office. And the whole multitude, how about this? The whole multitude of the people were praying out there in the court courtyard. <laughs> how about that? What would happen, you suppose, when the preacher got up to preach, the whole congregation was praying, right? They're all praying out there. Zacharias in the temple preparing and burning the incense. Amplified Bible says all the throng of people were praying outside of the court at the hour of incense burning. So they were alert. They knew this is the this is the this is the hour when the incense is burnt. So while Zacharias is in the temple going about his course, he's burnt. The people are praying. Now, the incense, as you know, the purpose of the incense, we had to be 24-7, mm -hmm. as they say. It was that the inside the temple, uh, tabernacle, and now temple, mm -hmm. there had to be this sweet fragrance at all time emitting. Uh -huh. And then when the Day of Atonement, the veil was open so the fragrance could... Yeah. There was a censer in there, mm -hmm. and they had to put fire in that censer and put incense on it and go in there and into the most holy place, it was that God had to have a fragrant fragrance all the time. Where he was, there had to be this fragrance emitted. Now, it's realized now in Christ Jesus, the fragrance of Christ is found in us. <clears throat> so now we have the following things taking place. This is probably done on the Sabbath day. The priest is ministering, whose lot it was to do so. Incense is being offered. Either the morning or the evening sacrifices are also being offered. Mm -hmm. The people have congregated in the temple court, mm -hmm. and the people are praying. Mm -hmm. now, now, there's a circumstance yeah. God can work in. Now, there's a lesson to be learned here. My persuasion that few professing Christians actually expect anything to happen when they, quote, go to church. Uh -huh. They don't really expect anything to happen. And it generally doesn't. That wasn't the case here. The mechanics of dead religion had been firmly set in place by the religious professionals. And uh, few people identified as the modern church have any idea about an environment that's conducive to experiencing contact with God. That's what can happen. Paul told the Corinthians, if a stranger comes in, all of you prophesy, he'll know God's, yes. yeah. God's among you people yes. because of what was going on. <laughs> now, there's some things said about what was going to take place in the New Covenant. That, that is the kind of environment mm -hmm. that will be produced by, by the prophets. They told us about it. Jeremiah said, I will satiate the soul of the priest with fatness, and my people shall be satisfied with my goodness. See, that was a frame. This is going to happen in the new covenant. The ransomed of the Lord shall return, come to Zion with songs and everlasting joy upon their heads, and shall obtain joy and gladness and sorrow and signs to flee away. See, that's, this happens now in the new covenant. When you come into the courts of the Lord, Sadness and sorrow should fly away. Amen. Therefore, the redeemed of the Lord shall return and come with singing to Zion. And Isaiah he quotes this again. Everlasting joy shall be upon their heads. They shall obtain gladness and joy and sorrow and si sorrow and mourning shall flee away. Yes. Isaiah 55, he said, uh, Ho, every one that thirsteth, come ye to the waters. And he that hath no money, come ye and buy and eat. Yea, come buy and wine and milk without money, without price. Anyway, he says, 
the E that which is good and let your soul delight itself in fatness. See, this is the environment now yeah, yeah. that the new covenant produces. Amen. And where this is actually experienced, mm -hmm. what he said, if where this is actually experienced, God is more apt to do something yes, amen. in that assembly. Uh -huh. And what it is, we have no idea yeah. how great amen. and how unusual it could be. Yes beyond any comprehension. We're talking about a God that with whom all things are possible that's looking for an opportunity. Yes, amen. Looking for a man uh -huh. whose heart's perfect toward him to show himself strong and yeah. well if he finds a group of people. Yeah. <laughs> <Amen>. <laughs> now there he is doing his job yeah. and there appears unto him which means he saw this, uh -huh. an angel of God, of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar. Mm -hmm. The angel of the Lord appeared to him. Mm -hmm. From the angel's point of view, it made himself visible, but the idea is Zacharias saw uh -huh. this angel. Now he was, I mean, in the holy place, going about ministry would make you more conscious of holy things. Yeah. Uh -huh. I know people who are so, they're so immersed in the mundane, they would probably not be aware if anything extraordinary happened. Yeah, right. uh -huh. They're just so caught up in the everyday stuff. Uh -huh. They wouldn't know. The time during which he Exercise the priest's office was a very appropriate time for the appearance. He was, his his consciousness was elevated. Uh -huh. The people in the court, their consciousness was elevated. Uh -huh. And so there it is, the angel standing at the right side of the altar. Yeah. Now the altar was directly in front of the veil that separated the holy place from the So he's standing right close to that veil. Yeah. He wasn't standing before the table of showbread. And he wasn't standing, which was on the right. He wasn't standing before the candlestick, which is on the left. He's standing before the altar of incense, mm -hmm. the fragments. Might be well to say here that some people hear very little from him who's speaking from heaven because they simply are in the wrong place. They're not close enough to the veil. <laughs> Or where the veil used to be. Yeah. They're not close enough to the yeah. holy place. They're just they're in the wrong place. See, you shouldn't expect to hear God in like the bar room. That's right. That's right. Maybe while you're at Olive Garden. Mm. I don't doubt that this could happen, but this is not the norm. This is you have to be where where God is more apt. Yeah. Amen. So when you choose to be someplace else, this is your we acknowledge this is your business. We're not gonna tell you what to do, but it was our obligation to tell you there are some places God doesn't go. Yeah, amen. Amen. Zacharias saw him and he's troubled. He didn't say, oh, an angel, Boy, what's this? what a day this is. I got to see this angel. Oh, this isn't how the holy angels affect men, not even righteous men. There's that much difference between creatures of heaven and men on earth. There's that much yeah. <laughs> difference that just just the he hasn't heard anything yet. Just seeing them troubled him and fear came upon him. This happened in the early church too. As soon as they became conscious of what God doing something, when Ananias was slain by the Lord, yeah. fear yeah. Right. fear came on everybody. Mm -hmm. Then when Sapphira fell dead. Great fear came on the church. The church, oh, I imagine they surveyed what. What are we doing here? What? Yeah, that's right. What kind of what kind of open doors are there here? Is this the kind of environment God's work in? Is anyone here prone to lie? You know. Yeah. Yeah, it perked them up right away. Amen. Fear came on them. The angel, he's merciful. He says, "Oh, fear not." Zacharias calls him by name. Fear not, Zacharias. Angels have often talked to people this way. One angel said to Daniel, Fear not, Daniel. Or, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not. Or, Fear not, Mary. 
Well, fear not, Paul. See, <laughs> it's personal. Why? Well, God doesn't work best in an environment of fear. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. This is not the best mm -hmm. surrounding. Sometimes it's a necessary surrounding. I understand that, but it's not the best. Mm -hmm. God didn't say much to the people at Sinai because they were in fear. See, so he, right. he said something to Moses mm -hmm. up on top of the mountain. Mm -hmm. So being conscious of God, thinking about God, thinking about the day of judgment, thinking about the coming of Christ scares you. Oh, you you got to get over that. Yeah, amen. It's just, it's not a psychological get uh, over that. Uh, yeah. You've got to you've got to come near to God and get your heart quieted down. Amen. Get in the presence of the Lord. The Lord will quiet your heart down. The peace of God will keep your heart and mind mm -hmm. through Christ Jesus. Now it'll, it'll happen. You but you need this. You need to see this. Mm -hmm. not Zacharias. Before I say anything else, we gotta mm -hmm. gotta calm. But this wasn't an irrational fear. See, some people, when they get fear, get fearful, they lose their sense. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. It, this isn't the kind of fear. Zacharias didn't become like a giddy-headed. Uh -huh. uh -huh. He still had his rationality, but this word that the angel spoke, I gather, was with power. Right? Uh -huh. Amen. Quiet and calm. Now he said, now listen, Zacharias, fear not, Zacharias, your prayer your prayer? He's an old man. Yeah. Your prayer has been heard. He must have been praying from since he was a young man about this. Because yeah. uh -huh. it was disgraceful for Jewish women not to have children. Uh -huh. Signing reproach. Your prayer, yeah. your prayer has been heard. Yeah. You're an old man now. Now you can't have children. By nature, mm -hmm. I, I come to tell you, your prayer has been heard. Yeah. Amen. So maybe there's something you've been praying about a long time. Yeah. Hmm. You've been praying about a long time. Mm -hmm. You kind of wonder if God's heard you. Mm -hmm. Then one day your heart will touch. I heard that. I've been hearing that prayer all along. Yeah. But now is now's the time. Yeah. Amen. Now's the time. So your prayer's been heard. Brother Gavin, I also see that that was a perfect timing for the Lord to tell him that yes. his prayer was heard when he was serving the Lord. That's yeah. right. Amen. That's exactly right. Yeah. See, the Jews knew from their history that God enabled barren women to have children. God made a point of recording that down there. You had Sarah, and you had Rebecca, and you had Rachel, and you had Samson's mother. All of them were barren. So they had a history of yeah. barrenness not being an obstacle with God. They knew that Sarah, the mother of Abraham, bore children too when she was not only barren, but she was of old age too. Yeah. So see, God gave that account for them. All of this shows the practical value of being acquainted with the working of the Lord. Yeah. See, if you know what God has done in the past, uh -huh you'll be able to correlate it with your present circumstance sometimes. It'll just fit right in there yeah. and, and give you reason to have confidence and have hope. Amen. Doctrinal statements are mingled with gracious demonstrations of their reality in human yeah. experience. Yeah. So Amen. the doctrine says this, then there's some examples yeah. that yeah. Uh -huh. are blended in with there. Amen. So you'll know that with God all things are possible. And you have things like, you know, David and Goliath and a whole host of impossible things that, that happen. Now, there's something else to be seen here. In the Abrahamic lineage, people became familiar with prayer, which is the form. Remember, men didn't begin to call on the name of the Lord until Seth's son, Enos. That was quite a period of time there. That a couple hundred years, people didn't pray. But they had learned to pray. Abraham prayed concerning knowing he would inherit the land. He, he prayed for Ishmael. He prayed for Abimelech. Isaac prayed for Rebekah. Rebekah prayed concerning her twins. Jacob prayed for deliverance from Esau. And there were examples. That was just in Genesis. There were examples of the people that prayed. Hezekiah's back against the wall. He prays. You know. <laughs> Throughout the history, 
prayer, intercession, and confession. They, this nation was bathed in the prayers of saints. So Zechariah, he'd been praying. Mm -hmm. Thy prayer's been heard. Yeah. Whoa. You know, the thing that uh, is a great sorrow to my heart that we've managed to raise a generation that is less cognizant or conscious of God than previous ones. Yeah, right. yeah. We've managed, somehow this has managed to get done. Mm -hmm. in our generation, it's a sad circumstance. See, so the angel who identifies himself a little later, he says, thy wife shall bear thee uh, uh -huh. a son. Amen. Yes, you're old. Yes, she's barren and old. Mm -hmm. Thy wife... Elizabeth, he yeah. spells it out. Remember, he said, Fear not, mm -hmm. Zacharias, thy wife, Elizabeth, yeah. shall bear thee a son. Is that going to be through a handmaid now? Mm -hmm. through, shall bear thee a son. God was intervening in the affairs of men, doing something that could not possibly take place if God didn't do it. Amen. The promise of a coming Savior had to be kept alive, and this was related to the coming of a Savior. Amen. Yeah. <coughs> The Almighty will not allow their human race to forget mm -hmm. what He's promised. Yeah. He'll keep it alive through somebody, mm -hmm. some remnant, some soul, and every generation will know what God's going to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh -huh. Thou shalt call His name John. See there. Mm -hmm. Name John means to whom Jehovah's gracious, and then every whatever resource you look for the meaning of John give you a different meaning, but it kind of boils down to God's gracious. To with the birth of John, a new day, mm -hmm. ho, 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 a new day Amen. Mm -hmm. was dawning. He's making it, he's identifying what's getting ready to happen way back in the beginning with Abraham uh, and Sarah. This same thing happened. So he's identifying yeah. the, this impossibility that was for Abraham. There's also, it's the same thing go over again. But notice that Christ isn't, that isn't the fruit of a barren woman. He, it was of, of a woman who had never known a man. That's right. See, it, it was even greater than this. Yeah. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. John was line, like a line of demarcation that stood between two yeah. covenants. Mm -hmm that were in stark contrast with one another. See, the law and the prophets were, as stated by both Matthew and Luke, the law and the prophets prophesied until John. Amen. Yep. Until John. Luke says the law and the prophets were until John. Yep. Since that time, the kingdom of God is preached. Hmm. Never so it was a this was a it was an inter this was an interim period. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The thrust of preaching would be different. Yeah. It would be a call to repentance with a promise of a coming savior. The sensitivity toward God would be raised. The level of it would be would be raised. For a season of a little more than six months, the acceptance of God's messenger would be more pronounced, but it kind of would begin to wane. They were really to rejoice in him for a season. And um, Gabriel says, now you're going you're gonna to have joy. You'll have joy and gladness. The coming of John the Baptist is foretold by the prophets, but not with the specificity revealed to Zacharias. Yeah. Isaiah said, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill shall be made low, and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough places plain. Mm -hmm. Malachi prophesied, Behold, I will send you the Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. He shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. Now, the prophecy of Malachi wasn't limited to John the Baptist, yeah. as I will show you shortly. Uh -huh. 
first Elijah of reference would be sent before the coming of the great and notable day of the Lord, which is the second coming. John the Baptist came before the before his first ministry. He preceded the Elijah of follow. So there's a difference there. Beside that, when John the Baptist, who was filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb, he was asked, Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Now I'm not going to, I'm unwilling to say he made a mistake there. Thirdly, he did not turn the hearts of the children to the fathers. Jesus said of the people's ultimate response to John, they did not know him, but did to him whatever they wished. They came to hear him preach, they were baptized by him, but eventually they just rejoiced in him, Jesus said, for a season. Not so with the Elijah of the Mal that Malachi prophesied about. And Jesus said that he would turn, the angel, Zechariah told, the angel told Zechariah, he will turn the hearts of many. Yeah. Uh -huh. That's not what Malachi said. Mm -hmm. Thou shalt have joy and gladness. When Sarah gave birth, you remember he said, she said, the Lord made me to laugh. Mm -hmm. Then all around her, they, they were glad too. And fulfill the word of the proverb, uh -huh. the father of the righteous shall greatly rejoice, and he that begetteth a wise son shall have joy of him. Thy father and thy mother shall be glad, and she that bear thee shall rejoice. That was fulfilled yeah. in uh -huh. Zacharias. And he, uh, he's going to be great in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. It's one thing for somebody to be great. I mean, that's, that's yeah. one thing. But to be great in the eyes of the Lord, now that, that, that's something else. Jesus said, I say unto you, among those that are born of, woman, of women, there is not arisen a greater prophet than John the Baptist, but he that's least in the kingdom of God is greater than he. Okay, what in the world does that mean? Well, John was a giant standing in the valley. Those that are least in the kingdom were midges, but they're on a mountain. He said, be great in the eyes of the Lord. See, God told Abraham, I'm going to make your name great. God, God can do this. I'm going to make your name great. This is 12, 2. Jacob said of Joseph's sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, Manasseh would be great. But truly his younger brother shall be greater. See, so God's able to... God told Joshua, this day I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, I will be with thee. So yeah. he made Joshua great. great. Yes. None of them were great in their generation. That's yeah. right. Mm. Yeah. They're not the ones in the history books. That's right. Yeah. They that sure aren't. They weren't great, but they're great now. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> now, when he said he magnified Joshua, he said, on that, on that day the Lord magnified Joshua in the sight of all Israel. Nobody else. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In the sight of Israel, they feared him as though they, as they feared Moses. Mm -hmm. God told Nathan, tell David, I've been, I, will, I have been with thee whithersoever thou walked, and have cut off all thine enemies from before thee, and have made, thee, made a name like the name of the great men of the earth. Tell, God, God made him great. Amen. Men who are truly great have been made so by God. Amen. They're preeminently great in his sight. Mm -hmm. As Brother Jason pointed out, they're not in the history yes. books. They excelled in their work for the Lord. Then he said, now this, this son of yours, he's, he's not going to, he's going to drink neither wine nor strong drink. Some versions say he'll drink no wine or liquor. Now the NIV says he'll never to take wine or other fermented drink. 
One person says he'll drink either wine or beer. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. Strong drink. What is strong drink? Strong drink has to do with fermentation, distillation, and the aging of a drink in which it obtains inebriating qualities or properties. That's what it is. Wine has to do with the fruit of the vine, yeah, that's right. not the fruit of the vat. Yeah, that's right. uh -huh. Amen. Strong drink isn't the fruit of the vine. Uh -huh. that's, that's after you process what comes from the, from the vine. Uh -huh. Fresh grape juice can make you drunk in your belly. Uh -huh. If you're filled with new wine, fresh grape juice, like Noah, Noah planted a vineyard, he drank of the wine of it. It wasn't like aged wine. That's right. It made him drunk because it fermented in the belly. Mm -hmm. Became drunk. We infer from this that John was a Nazarite, although it doesn't say he was. And Nazarites were told the same same instruction given to them, except it mentions the word vinegar, which speaks of fermentation. <coughs> Now, pre now, this is a hot topic, you understand, for a lot of people. That's because they want to drink wine. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Priests were also forbidden to enter the tabernacle if they drank wine or strong drink. Mm. And if they did enter it, mm. they had to die. Yeah. Because the scripture says it impaired their judgment. Yeah. Yeah. Solomon, who guzzled a lot of wine, told his son, it's not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Amen. Among other things, this infers that no feast or ceremony of the Jews required the people to drink strong drink of wine, or John didn't keep the feasts. Yeah. It's the other alternative. <laughs> As I mentioned to you, the fruit of the vine is distinguished from all other forms of forms of drink. And Jesus pointedly took the cup and said, fruit of the vine. Yeah. Uh -huh. He didn't say this wine. He said, right. fruit of the vine. Uh -huh. Zacharias and Elizabeth, now they were, remember they're aged. Uh -huh. They were to ensure John at no time drank wine or strong drink. Not even by accident. See, some people in their house, you, <laughs> uh -huh. the kid would find some if it was there and drink it. Uh -huh. yeah. hmm? They he couldn't. They had to make these yeah. old parents. Now these are old. Uh -huh. These are old. John couldn't touch it ever at any time, all his life, all the time growing up. They had to make sure that didn't happen. Amen. And I gather they did. That's right. Yeah. Well, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Couldn't eat a raisin. Yeah. Mm -hmm. mm. yeah. So that you can see how that uh, without devotion, that'd be pretty hard to yeah. <laughs> do that. He shall be filled with the Holy Spirit from his mother's womb. Now, this is the only infant of record of which this is said. We assume that Jesus was, but it wasn't. But this said of John, he was filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. But we, have, we give thanks to the translators. They have managed to garble this up too, like they usually do. The NIV reads, from his mother's womb, reads a verse, even from birth. Then in a footnote it adds, or from his mother's womb. Even before his birth, the New Rivera Standard says, while still in his mother's womb, Holman Bible says, even before he's born, God's word says, while yet in his mother's womb. See, I'm showing you that most of the versions did get the message. Uh -huh. At the time when he's being born, there's the international version. From the very hour of his birth, there's Weymouth. From the hour of his birth, Montgomery, still from the belly of his mother's, Apostolic Bible, from his very birth, good speed, from the moment he leaves the mother's womb, there's the message, Bible, 
even in and from his mother's womb, the Amplified. See, so what did it mean? It meant exactly what it said. Yeah. In the womb. From his mother's womb doesn't mean as he exited from yeah. his mother's womb, yeah. from the moment of conception in the yeah. mother's yeah. womb, yeah. what he's talking about. Yeah. That's where life begins. Yeah. In the womb. Even Solomon, he knew this. He said in Ecclesiastes 11.5, how the bones do grow in the womb. He said, men don't know how the bones do grow. That's, growth is a sign of life, see? So at the point of life, that's, that's when he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And beside that, we know this is the case because when Mary came there, John the Baptist leaped in her womb. He recognized Christ while, he's in the, while Mary was in Mary's womb and was in, in Elizabeth's womb. Mother of my Lord, is what she said. Yeah. Which, would, which would kind of uh, support the argument that Jesus had the Holy Spirit from his mother's room, too. Yeah. I mean, it, it, just that inference. I yeah. Mean. yeah. This is the only one that's saying yeah. this way, yeah. And he's going to turn many of the children of Israel, many, many, uh -huh. to, to the Lord. Now, at this point, John the Baptist is known to have differed from that of Elijah. Mm -hmm. Behold, I send you unto you, Elijah the prophet, before the coming of the Lord, the great and dreadful day of the Lord, and he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a, cur with a curse. Yeah. Now, John didn't do this. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He's Isaiah's. He fulfilled Isaiah's prophecy. Mm -hmm. Not this one. John, uh, for the very people to whom he ministered, John the Baptist, were the very ones that called for Jesus' death. Yeah. He was the forerunner of Malachi's prophecy. Mm -hmm. That's why he said he came in the spirit and power. He was, yeah. he was, a, he was a kind of prophet Elijah was. Uh -huh. yeah. And uh, that this, uh, a latter Elijah, he was that kind of a prophet. Mm -hmm. He was a powerful, yeah. powerful prophet. But Jesus said that people are willing for a season yeah. to rejoice in his light. For a season, see. But that's not what Malachi says about this other, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Elijah. In other words, the John the Baptist ministry, no national change was wrought by that ministry. Right. Uh -huh. Nobody came to his defense when Herod had been president him, mm -hmm. that we know of. That kind of change would be wrought after Jesus put away sin, went back to heaven, then when this turning would take a new uh, uh -huh. new stance. He shall go before him, before the Lord Jesus, in the spirit, in the spirit and power mm -hmm. of Elijah. See, no one of that, of that generation, no one had seen a prophet like that mm -hmm. before that commanded such attention the people came out. To, yeah to see him. No one had seen a prophet like that before. Yeah. Other versions say equipped with the spirit and power of Elijah. As I've already pointed out, when the disciples asked Jesus, what do the scribes mean when they say Elijah will come first? What do they mean when they say that? This is when they were coming down from the Mount of Transfiguration. And here's Jesus' answer. And Elijah shall first come and restore all things. It was his first answer. John the Baptist had already been martyred. Other versions say Elijah is coming first and will restore all things. NIV says to be sure Elijah comes and will restore all things. Basic Bible English or the New Revised Standard says, Elijah is indeed coming. Basic Bible English, Elijah truly has to come and put all things right, see? So this, and then he said, but if you'll receive it, he's already come. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So the, what he was saying was John the Baptist was that kind of prophet, yeah. but he did not mm -hmm. fulfill that total, yeah. total prophecy. 
Elijah would turn the heart of the fathers to their children, to the children, and the heart of the children of the fathers. He's, he's not talking about fathers and children. He's talking about the fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yeah. The people would have the kind of faith yeah. that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had because this prophet Elijah would have the kind of power yes. that Elijah had of, of all time. Then I dealt with why Jesus said, why did Jesus say what he did? Why'd you will come? Because the people in John the Baptist were exposed to the kind of ministry Elijah would have. The Elijah that, w that is going to come. He said he is going to come. Yeah. Whether it's going to be Elijah coming from the unseen world, I, I don't, or whether it's going to be someone like him, I don't know what's going to be. But it wouldn't surprise me that the real Elijah just yeah. so happened he didn't die. You know, just kind of a technicality. But right. So Jesus said, as he, well, it's hard to understand. Well, they just take just take it for what it says and, and let it go. Don't, yeah. don't, don't get all distracted by it and speculating about yes. it. Jesus said what he meant to say, yes, Elijah is coming. He is coming, but... If you can receive it now, he's already, he's already come. So you've been exposed to the kind of prophet that's going to come yeah. later. And he's going to, he said, the angel said, he's going to make ready a people for the Lord. Yeah. People had to be made ready for Christ. Now this is a, mm -hmm. this is like a forgotten thing today. People had to be made ready for Christ, to be prepared for him. I'll give you a few things that they have that has to happen. They have to have a proper view of God for one. They have to have a proper view of sin for another. They have to be convicted of sin for something else. They have to have the persuasion to cease sinning. It has to, it has to dawn on them. They have to have a sorrow for having committed sin. Their mind has to change about sin. Yeah. Sin has to be confessed in a public acknowledgement by baptism of the guilt of sin and the resolve to no longer yield to it. See, that this all has to happen mm -hmm. before a person comes into Christ. John the Baptist prepared the people by re preaching repentance. Mm -hmm. you got to stop living the way you were. Amen. Amen. This has to stop. Yeah. And you have to prepare your heart. Oh, Zacharias hears all this, and this is marvelous. You know, he, remember, he's a righteous man, walking blameless. He said, um, whereby shall I know this? I am an old man, and my wife well is my wife well stricken in years. Now the response of Zacharias confirms that the weakness of the flesh. See, That's right. does it make it excusable? Because it wasn't. He's going to you find out it wasn't. Zacharias was engaged in the work of the Lord when he made this yes. observation. The Holy Spirit has described him as a man who is righteous before God. But see, that doesn't mean you're always ready mm -hmm. for some some word from God that contradicts human logic. Yeah. But he had a lapse at this time. Mm -hmm. Should teach us to be vigilant and alert Amen. at all times. Mm -hmm. So how am I going to know? The angel answers, I'm Gabriel. Yeah. I mean, I'm Gabriel yeah. that stand in the presence of God. And I'm sent unto thee and to show thee these glad tidings. Yeah. You're, a you're asking me how you know when you're talking to an angel from a God yeah. that's been sent a message from God to you? We have the record of 
Gabriel appearing to Daniel, to Mary, to Zacharias. The name Gabriel means champion of God. This is a very unusual angel. This is the angel that explained to Daniel the vision of the ram and the he goat. He explained that whole vision to Daniel, and he also explained the meaning of the 70 weeks, which is some pretty profound things. See, angels, they're rational beings, they're not robots. Yeah. They're like wind up and come to earth and yeah, blue, right. just, yeah. it's, they're rational beings. Yeah. They can apparently navigate through questions and circumstances and yes. assess things. They have wisdom. David referred to the wisdom of an angel. Mm-hmm. Think of the rationality that angels had, the record of angels that carried out a commission from God that had some rationality. They could think on their feet, so to speak, yeah. and assess things. Take, for instance, the uh, being sent to Lot. Mm-hmm. They pulled Lot inside the house when he stepped out to reason yeah. with those sodomites. See? Yeah. I mean, I don't know that that was on the, on the sheet. Point one, pull them in. They smote the man with blindness. That appears to be a decision. They smote the man with blindness. Who saw it in the house. They inquired if Lot had any other relatives. You got any relatives, sons, or anybody in the city? If you do, go to them, bring them here. Because we're going to destroy the city. See, these are things that they kind of assessed on the fly. In the morning, the angels, they hasted Lot. Tell him to take his wife and two daughters and flee from the city, lest they be consumed. And Lot lingered. Yeah. They knew what to do. They knew what to do. They took hold of his hand, his wife's hands, his daughter's hands, and brought him out of the city and placed him outside the city yeah. and said, flee. Yeah. Get away from here. They either did that on, it looks like on their own, but I'm showing you that God's messengers have the ability to process what they're doing Amen. and know what to do. Yeah. When Lot discerned, when Lot lingered, they took hold of him, and then when he discerned that he couldn't make it to the nearest city, mm-hmm. to the furthest city, he said, let me go to this little city here. I can't, I can't make it. And the angel answered him. He said, I've accepted thee. This is his angel talking. The angel didn't say, Father, what do I do now? He just said, I, I'll, I've accepted thee. Concerning this thing also, that I will not overthrow this city. Haste ye now, escape thither. I cannot do anything till thou be come thither. Therefore they call the name of the city Zoar. See, this angel. <laughs> when Israel was delivered from Egypt, God told Moses, I'm not going to go with you. Because I can't stand this people. If I go with you, I'll kill this whole nation. We dedicate that to the people that have a distorted view of the love of God. Here's what he told Moses. Mine angel shall go before thee and bring thee in unto the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Canaanites, the Hivites, Jebusites. I will cut them off. Again he said to them, Therefore now go, lead the people into the place which I have spoken to thee. Behold, mine angel shall go before thee. Right, this angel had discretionary yeah. uh-huh. powers. Yeah. Yeah. We know this by what God said. Yeah. Behold, I send an angel before thee to keep thee in the way and to bring thee to the place where I have prepared. Beware of him. Yeah. Uh-huh. Now, don't monkey around with this angel. Yes. Beware of him and obey his voice. Yes. Provoke him not. He'll not pardon your transgressions, for my name's in him. But if thou shalt indeed obey his voice and do all that I speak, then I will be an enemy and so forth. See, so this angel, yeah. there were some guidelines given to him, I'm sure, but he, uh-huh. he had discretionary powers. Now, I, we can learn from this. This is a studied opinion of mine, I must admit. I, I think I have the Spirit of God in this. It appears to me that when God gives someone something to do, there's a certain amount of wisdom that's allocated with the commission. That if they'll stay, if they'll stay in the boundaries of the will of God, it'll be given them what they ought to say and what they ought to do, and they'll know how to respond to every situation. 
A truly spiritual posture assumes that the individual is absorbed with what God is leading them to do. This has captured his attention. And I'm saying that there's some degree of wisdom that accompanies that. Now, now Gabriel addresses Zechariah's response. He says, And behold, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my words. Tell us someone and say, Well, it's just a hasty word, just a hasty word. Huh? No, it was unbelief. Yeah, that's right. It was unbelief. Thou shalt be dumb. You're not going to be able to talk. Yeah. We don't want you saying anything more. This is a, if, this is a, if this is a sample of how you're going to talk, we're going to just stop that right here. Right. <laughs> Remember, all he did, he asked a question. That's all he did was ask his question. Yep. Whereby shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. Uh -huh. This is Gabriel now. He has wisdom. Yeah. He says that that was unbelief. Yeah. Uh -huh. When the Lord says to us, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Are we to respond by saying, how can I know this? Well, I think some people have responded this way. If we are told, His divine power hath given us all things that pertain to life and God, and through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, is it right to respond, How can I be sure of this? If we're told, If we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. And if we know that He hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desire of Him. Are we at liberty to say, but how can I know I'm asking for something that's in God's will? What are those responses? They're unbelief. Yeah, amen. Amen. Mm. It's going to kind of come close to home, I'll tell you right now. Uh -huh. This is really unacceptable with God. 